Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of A God Shift. I'm your host, Shana Rattler. Thank you so much for being here. And before we get started, I would love if you would do me a favor. Wherever you're listening to this episode, I just want you to take a screenshot. With that screenshot, I want you to post it on your social media, tag us here at A God Shift, and then I just want to hear your biggest aha moment or your biggest takeaway from this episode. And the reason why I do that is because I know that there are so many believers that want to do their part to uphold and protect Christian values. And a lot of people just don't know where to start. And so the more times these episodes are shared, the more people we know will be equipped with the strategies and the tips and and tools that we share during these episodes. So thank you so much in advance for being willing to share, share, share. I'm going to read my guest bio and we're going to get into what I know is going to be another great conversation. My guest today is a state and national champion time trialist and trialist and has written several books and authored several technical and political articles published in Town Hall magazine. He is currently seeking the vice chair for Chaffee County Libertarians and is a congressional candidate for Colorado's 7th District. He owns a BS in electrical engineering from Penn State University. He worked as a test engineer for Texas Instruments for 22 years and owns two patents. He was both a supervisor and elected distinguished member of the technical staff for his elite technical contributions. He spends his free time studying constitutional law. His his law, theology, history, and science, his books, Defending Freedom of Contract, and recently released Our God-Given Fundamental Rights, details the progressive change in both the Supreme Court and American society. He is afflicted with an undiagnosed autoimmune neuromuscular condition that is currently being investigated by the Undiagnosed Disease Network. I want to welcome to the show Patrick Bohan. Thank you for having me, Shane. I'm so excited that you are here. So there's so much that I want to talk to you about, Patrick, that I know the the listeners need to be equipped and they need to better understand. And one of those things is this notion of church and state. You know, I heard a lot about that, like in middle school and like in my constitution class in high school. And I don't know that I really gave much thought to it other than the fact that, okay, the church is going to mind their business. The states are going to mind their business and they're not going to kind of co meagle things. That's kind of how I, how I thought about things. And now that I'm a little bit older and I'm a little more mature and I'm very involved in the faith-based space, I find that I see different implications and different forms of applying church and state. And so from your position with your experience and your studies, I would love if you could just kind of clear up this whole notion of of how church and state is being applied wrong and what it really should be instead. Well, I I think what people need to understand first off is that separation of church and state is is a fabricated uh, constitutional doctrine. If you look at, you read the constitution, it's nowhere in there. So uh, what, if you look back at early history, uh, when, when the colonies were first being formed, uh, what happened is that a lot of the colonies were founded on and established on religion. And what happened over time is that these colonies would, would start taxing people to support the state-sponsored religion. Mm-hmm. And when that happened, we were basically doing taxation without representation because there were people like the Baptists uh, uh, weren't part of the state-sponsored religion, so they were being taxed. So we had taxation without representation. And so that was the same reason that we were fighting against England. And so our founders put in the Constitution, in the First Amendment, part of free speech, or if free speech, freedom of religion, but you also have the Establishment Clause. And the Establishment Clause a lot of people think that separation of church and state is part of the establishment clause, mm. but that's really a prohibition against uh, the government. It's not a prohibition against the people. And that's the key thing, because it's a prohibition against the government to establish religion. And they put that in place because of that history. Um, so it, it's really, to me, it's a fabricated doctrine. It, it doesn't make 
any sense. But what, what we're seeing now is we're having freedom from religion, not freedom of religion, because no one could practice uh, religion on on public on public grounds. You can't can't talk about religion. You can't pray, even if you do it privately. Uh, you can't wear a cross. You can't have a Bible with you. And that's not what separation of church and state. The 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 definition that that was originally supposed to be used. That's not how it was supposed to be used. Wow. And so. Why should we care? Like as Christians that that live here in the country, like why why is that something that is important to us? And is there anything that we can do to protect it or play a role in making sure that it's being pl- applied correctly? Well, it's important to us because a lot of us know we have rights, but we don't necessarily know what all those rights are. Wow. And if, if the government goes in and, and infringes on just say one right, what a lot of people don't know is a lot of our rights are interrelated. And if the government can reach out and start infringing on one set of rights, it could start doing that to just about anything it wants. And so it's government expansion, it's government control. And so if, if, if say a liberal wants to limit religious freedom, but I always tell them, be careful what you wish for, because mm-hmm. that could be turned around and used against you for something that you really care about. That's right. So that's that to me is the important aspect there. And, you know, I'm sure that there's a lot of things that like getting the right politicians in place can do for this. But is there anything that um, everyday Americans can do to kind of protect the these? Well, I I. I would, I would, I would tell people, don't be afraid to, uh, you know, pray at a football game. Uh, well, the good news is right now the modern court is trying to correct some of these errors. Now it probably has a long way to go, but there was this case of, uh, I think, I believe it was a Washington State high school football coach, hmm. and he lost his job, job because he prayed at 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 that football at a football game. And the Supreme Court ruled on his side. So, again, he wasn't allowed to do this because this was a a school activity, a public activity. And so I tell people there's there's a lot of uh, companies out there that that take cases pro bono. The the gentleman, that masterpiece cake shop gentleman uh, in Colorado, where he he did not want to make a a, 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 what was it? A. A gay wet wedding cake or something yeah, of that I nature, that. and and there's there's a, com- a company uh, uh, it's called Alliance Defending Freedom. So there's people out there that will support you, and I tell people don't be afraid if, if even if you're on public grounds, you know, pray do what do what you have to. We had this is what this country was founded on. Yeah, you talked a little bit about our God-given fundamental rights. I know you've written a book on them. I know there's probably a lot of them, but can you tell us a, a little bit about what some of those God-given fundamental rights are and how we can protect them? Yeah, so I my one of my aspects is when I'm run when I'm running here for um uh, you know, Congress is that I want to do a fundamental rights amendment mm. or legislation and or legislation. And I think that that would be a good way to protect our rights, define what they are, what the criteria is. And so we have both what are called enumerated rights and enumerated rights are those that are already in the Constitution and in particular, the Bill of Rights. And so that would reinforce those rights, because as I just talked about, like religious liberty is being infringed. So we have to reinforce those rights. And then there's what are called unenumerated rights. And that's where things get a little bit trickier. So now when I wrote the the book, Our God-Given Fundamental Rights, I did not make up uh, what our rights are. I, I, I didn't list come up with a list off my head. So what I used was I used historical uh, cases and and landmark uh, legislation uh, in our history, as well as I I also looked, what what gave me the God-given part is 
I looked to see if I could find that principle or that right identified in the Bible. Yes. And so if I could corroborate those two, and then I followed the, so I followed the natural law uh, definition of what a right should be. And what a right should be is something that is uh, unanimously accepted by the people. So it, it, it can't be something that's, say, based on our demographics or uh, based on um, an entitlement, a government entitlement. So I had to put up that they have to be unanimously accepted, corroborated the principle in, in, in the Bible and, and, and found in historical uh, uh, documentation, uh, cases and, and legislation. And so that's how I came up with a list. So some of some of the ones that are outside of the uh, unenumerated rights, I would say is the right to work a lawful profession. Now, I don't think anybody would ever disagree with that. Uh, parental rights, family rights, kind of the same. Uh, the right to enter into contracts and, and enter out of contracts. The right to travel freely, uh, to right to make lawful choices, uh, even even things that a lot of people would find may find objectionable, but they when when you ask everyone about it, the right to profit. Uh, I think even even liberals would would like to have more money in their paycheck than than uh, <laughs> so then, I, I I still think that's a that's a fundamental right that's protected. As a matter of fact. Thomas Jefferson and our founders were very, very big on that. And, and the Bible's very big on that, right? The Bible also says things like charity should come from the, uh, the community, not the government. And so that's important. And, and, and the right to profit is that, you know, taxes should be, you know, reasonable. And so we're, no one's saying that we, we shouldn't have any taxes, but they should be reasonable. And the Constitution has 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 some very strict limits. Uh, Article One, Section Eight, basically outlines what the functions of the federal government are, and they're very limited. But we've gone way beyond those. So those are some of the rights, and there's there's more in the in the book. Uh, but we we really have uh, an unlimited number of rights. It's mm -hmm. just trying to identify what are the most uh, necessary and essential rights that, that should have constitutional protection. I love the way you approach this book. And given that there is a, a pretty wide scope, if you will, of the types of rights that are in there, is there an easy way to discuss how we as American citizens, everyday citizens can protect those rights? What are some of the things that we can do? Oh, well, I think we need to be more aware of what our rights are. I mean, everyone talks about our rights. Like, if, for example, if someone says that health care is a right or some kind of government created entitlements are right, well, they're going off, off the assumption that rights are, are guaranteed. Yeah. Because someone else has to pay for them. Well, God doesn't guarantee us anything. Even if you read the Declaration of Independence, it, it says, uh, you know, you have the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. You're not guaranteed anything. You're not guaranteed happiness. You're not guaranteed liberty. So you're not guaranteed anything. Uh, and, 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 and people may, may go after some rights more than others. Like mm -hmm. some people may use the right to work more than others because they have to. They need more than one job. So I think trying to identify what is a good definition of them is the first step, because once you have that definition, then you can really define what those what those rights are. And people should be aware of them because the government is taking them away from us and we don't even know it. So once you know what they are, then and a lot of people don't even think that the Constitution can protect rights that aren't in the uh uh, like unenumerated rights that aren't listed in in, in the uh, Constitution, but they can. Wow. Uh, the ninth the Ninth Amendment should allow that, but that's another big long story on how that got convoluted. Yeah. 
Well, I love how this conversation is going. We're going to take a quick break. And when we come back, we're going to discuss this a little bit further. We'll be right back. God is commissioning women leaders to uphold Christian values and change the course of history for his glory and to mobilize other women to blaze the same trail. Want to know what type of kingdom leader you are and learn specific strategies to impact change based on your type? Find out by going to kingdomtrailblazerquiz.com right now. All right, welcome back. So you're running for Congress, Patrick. I'm curious, in your opinion, what should Christians be looking for in a political leader? You know, if it's if it's if we have a desire, and I hope we do, I probably shouldn't even say if, since we as Christians have a desire to uphold and protect our Christian values, what should we be looking for in a political leader? I think wisdom. Wisdom is the first thing we should be looking for. A lot of people really confuse what knowledge and wisdom are, and they're not the same thing. Even if you read the Bible, right? The Bible always talks in terms of knowledge, understanding, and wisdom. And they're not the same thing. Knowledge is kind of the first step in, in, in getting wisdom. But until you understand the facts, and until you um know what what conclusions to draw then you really you really don't have you don't really have wisdom until you get to that point and that's a problem with modern society modern society where we like to listen to one point of view mm -hmm. uh, we don't like to learn new perspectives the only way to defend your side of an argument is to understand all perspectives if you see two people debating and it devolves into personal attacks well they are not following the, the moral principle, the virtue to tolerate one another and to, you know, they, they can argue respectfully. And so we're, we're getting away from God, even those I, I believe that go to church and practice, we're moving further away from God in that respect. And I think there's this misunderstanding of what wisdom is. And you want to look for someone that's, that's not trying to be divisive, but really focused on, on facts. That's good. At the time of this recording, it is February of 2024, which means that this is an election year. Are there any particular um, topics, any particular policies, if you will, that we can expect to be ones that we need to pay attention to when we're considering who we should vote, especially if we're, we're talking about it from in terms of like our Christian values? Yeah, I mean, I think parental rights is a is is a is a huge one. Uh, family rights. Um, I, talk, I, I, talk a little I tell, bit more about that because I know you're somewhat of an expert on on this. You've studied this a little bit more. So talk a little bit about these family rights and parental rights. Tell us what we need to know so that we can really make an educated and informed decision. It's the law. That's what you need. The law. That's what you need to know. the The Supreme Court has already ruled that. Um, family rights are protected. It was decided a hundred years ago in a landmark a Supreme Court case, uh, Pierce v. Society of Sisters. In that case, Justice McReynolds held the responsibility for the upbringing of children resides with the parents, not the state, not the school, not teachers. That was an education case. So people should not be afraid to, hey, look, I'm going to... Uh, fight for that parental rights means I get to choose where my child gets to go to school and okay. their tax dollars should follow them. And if the child is homeschooled, then they should get a tax refund. Uh, parental rights means that you should be getting permission slips. We used to get permission slips when we were younger and I hear that that's stopped. Really? To approve all, all these extracurricular activities. I've heard in some instances. I'm, I'm uh, you should surprised. You should be able to approve and review curriculum and, and books. Now it's a lot more work for parents, but if they do that, it, 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 having educational choice will give re, uh, religious schools more opportunities to educate 
kids because if the tax dollars follow that child, then there's more of a chance for kids to be brought up in that kind of environment. So that would be a huge thing. Yeah. Uh, try to get get us back. I, I would love to see a, a Christian revival of some kind. And it, um, I, I think it's pretty much a pipe dream. Uh, but I think, of, you know, but the way to do that is, you know, we got to start educating uh, kids and it, because that generation is drifting further and further away. Yes, I, I agree. And I, I can't, I can't agree with you more when it talks about, you know, how the parents should find out what their rights are in terms of what is happening in their children's schools, because it blows my mind. The thing, you know, my child is 26, so I'm very far removed from what goes on in school. These you don't days. look like you should have a child that's 26. Well, thank you. <laughs> I appreciate you. you saying that. <laughs> but, um, you know, I, I hear some of the things that are maybe three or four years ago, I was listening to a friend and she was complaining about the fact that one of the math word problems was, you know, Johnny has a boyfriend and if this and if that, like, you know, solve the problem. And I was just like, oh, oh my gosh, I just thought it was the most horrific thing. But now you fast forward two or three years later and I'm hearing that now it's just downright vulgar, the things that are in these books and the things that they're learning and even the wording that they're choosing to use to describe female genitalia in eighth grade school books blows my mind. And so, yes, we absolutely, I, I think I think if we stopped at that one, that that would be important enough. Yes, as Christians, find out what your parental and family rights are. So at the very least, you can try to do your part of controlling what's going into your kids' minds. Well, we, we, we talk about it like it's some, the left likes to talk about it like it's some kind of fabricated right that the, that the, that the right has made up just here in recent times. And I, that's what I try to point out that it's already the law and the yeah. law is on your side. Um, I, I, you know, when I read some of the things that you're saying, I'm just, I say to myself, please, there's no way that this can be true. Yes. Please tell me that this is, <laughs> this is false. <laughs> I mean, let kids be kids, you know, let them have fun, let them, you know, they can so, make their choices. The There's plenty hearing, of time for them to make choices. They don't have to grow up overnight. Correct. And some of the things that I'm hearing that they're like giving how to in some of these books, I'm like, why does a child need to know how to do that anyway? Why do they even need to know from the school that that's something that they could do? Let alone, I'm going to teach you how to do it. It just, it's, it's mind blowing. So there's what? When I write a fundamental rights amendment, I'm going to say that the government can't infringe on these for any reason, even in cases of emergencies, because I don't believe that the government has has shown itself uh, capable during emergencies like COVID or even after 9-11, because we're seeing things like, you know, of warrantless searches of, of citizens and such. But I, I, I don't know. Uh, I kind of lost my trend of thought. I, that's what happens to me when I start going off uh, on, on on some tangents. But when it comes to parental rights, uh, yeah, I mean, it, it would be a good place to start. Oh, what I was going to say, there is one area where where the government can can infringe on 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 rights. And, okay. and if you ever look at it, it's it's well, there's probably a couple. You know, if if, if someone's imprisoned for violating the rights of someone else, well, obviously their rights are gonna be restricted, right? Because yeah. you're, you're confined, but you can confine the rights of children. And that's a, there's a reason why it, it, children have to be 18 to uh, to drive or, or yeah. uh, maybe not 18, but, or go to an R yeah. movie or to smoke. To drive, or, 18 to, to vote, 21 to consume alcohol, but they can be set to inside they right. want to change their change their sex and nobody's supposed to be able to do anything about that. It's mind blowing. Yeah. Yeah. So that's that's absurd. So if you could restrict those things to go to like an R-rated movie or something, then then yeah. Those rights can be curbed for children. And there's a reason for that because they're not mature enough yet. Correct. And that's why they want you to be, be 18 to vote. That that's You just said something that I never even thought of. We have to be of a certain age to go to an R-rated movie, yet you're putting R-rated content in a textbook. Is yeah. that not- I, I, never, I, 
I didn't think of it that way either, but that's what, yeah, that's, that's what we're saying. <laughs> that's exactly what we're saying. Goodness. Well, we're almost out of time, Patrick, but I definitely want people to, to get this book of yours. We've got to learn all of the different fundamental rights that we have. We don't even know, you know, we don't even have a leg to stand on if we don't even know what leg we can stand on. Can you tell the audience um, how they can get the book? Yeah, it's it's it is listed on on Amazon, and you could get it from the uh, the the book publisher. And I think well, they they probably put it out at most publishing sites like Barnes and Nobles, and uh, at the, their uh, Advantage Books uh, is the name of that that company. I think they're a Christian based uh, okay publisher. How can they follow um, you on social media? Yeah, on on Twitter, um, uh, Patrick Bohan four, the number four, and on uh, on Facebook, uh, um, uh, Patrick Bohan four Congress. But that that four is spelled out F O R. Um, and on uh, my website is uh, www.patrickbohan.com. So it's just my name. Com. Awesome. Well, I'm going to make sure that the links to all of this is in the show notes. Patrick, I want to thank you so much for being here today. I want to thank you so much for enlightening us and giving us something to, to make educated decisions. And of course, I want to wish you good luck in the congressional um, race this year. Well, I'm going to need a lot of help because I'm running actually as a libertarian. So I'm probably to get 1% of the vote will probably be a uh, be, be be tough to do, but you know, I, I got my reasons for doing that, but uh, um, we'll see how it goes. Awesome. Well, good luck. Nevertheless, everyone share, share, share this episode. This is an election year. And so many people I hear tell me that they don't even know where to start in trying to learn what these candidates stand for and what they should even be looking for, especially when we hear all the time, like it's the lesser of two evils. So please, please share, share, share this episode. I hope it has blessed you like it has blessed me. And I pray that you will go back and listen to future and previous episodes as well. Everyone have a great day. Bye-bye.